These 10 people on screen lurked the streets of London, destroying the lives of countless people. Today, we unravel the haunting tales of 10 notorious serial killers, with each case proving that evil is not limited to time period or gender. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and these are 10 London serial killer cases. This brings us to our first case. Peter Bryan, one of the most terrifying serial killers from London. He was a cannibalistic killer who terrorized London between 1993 and 2004. And as his crime spree went on, his crimes became more and more horrific. He was born on the 4th of October 1969 in London, and his parents were immigrants from Barbados. He left school at the age of 14 and started doing a job at a clothes stall, and later, he moved on to teach cooking lessons at his local soup kitchen. Many aspects of his early life influenced his criminal actions. He had a troubled childhood, marked by neglect and mistreatment. Growing up in a challenging environment had a major impact on his mental health. He was also diagnosed with schizophrenia. His future criminal history will leave you wondering just how far the depths of darkness can go. His first victim was named Nisha Shet. She was a young woman who worked as a shopkeeper. 20-year-old Nisha Shet rejected him in his love claims. So, Peter decided to attack the young Nisha, who he hit on the head with a hammer. This cruel incident occurred in 1993. He was found guilty of manslaughter, which means he was considered partially accountable for the death because of his mental state at that time. Because of his insanity, he was sent to the Broadmoor Hospital for mental illness. In 2002, when doctors diagnosed a great improvement, he was transferred to a London psychiatrist centre, where he would have the possibility of going outside, always under the supervision of psychiatrists. Two years later, Peter started going on the streets. He was permitted to leave under supervision. Only a few hours after being released, he did the unthinkable. At noon on February 17, 2004, he ventured into the street. At approximately 8pm that same day, Police and social workers were alerted to an exceptional case of cannibalism involving Peter. This time the victim was his friend, named Brian Cherry. After leaving the center, Peter thought about visiting his friend Brian. When he opened the door for him, Peter hit him on the head with a hammer. He gave him more than 30 blows with the hammer, which caused his death. He then decided to cook some parts of the dead man and eat them. He killed Brian in the same way he killed Nisha, by beating him to death with a hammer. When the police arrived, they found Peter sitting quietly in the hall. His pants, his hands, and his shoes were all stained with blood. In the kitchen, police found some leftover toast with some meat spread on it, as well as a container of butter. Further investigation revealed that the smeared meat was Brian Cherry's brain tissue, which had been devoured with butter. The police who approached Peter found him cooking Brian's brain. He cooked his friend's brain in butter and ate it. He confessed that the human brain has a delicious taste. Peter was so insane that he considered the human body a strong source of nourishment. He even told the psychiatrist that he expected to kill eight more people. He received a life sentence and was sent back to Broadmoor Hospital. On the 25th of April 2004, when Peter was in Broadmoor Hospital, he killed another inmate, Richard Loudwell. Peter took advantage of the carelessness of the staff and strangled Richard Loudwell a 60-year-old patient. On the 15th of March 2005, Brian admitted in court that he was accountable for causing the deaths of two people. Brian had murdered those two people because it gave him a sense of power and excitement when he ate their flesh. In a 2012 investigation, Peter Brian said that he smashed Loudwell's head against the ground and tied a ligature around his neck so he wouldn't make a sound. He also confessed to nurse Joanne Fisher that he attacked Loudwell because he wanted to eat him. He admitted that he always dreamed of becoming a serial killer and considered cannibalism to be normal since according to him, human meat has a lot of nutritious proteins. After that, he was ordered to serve two life sentences in prison. The man known as the Camden Ripper was once a family man, a compassionate father, and a loving husband. Though his name is now forever associated with some of the most gruesome acts the city has ever seen. Anthony John Hardy was born in Burton-upon-Trent, England, on January 31st, 1951. Hardy led what appeared to be an ordinary life as both a child and an adult, working as a civil engineer and later as a taxi driver, 
until his arrest. Hardy married his classmate in 1972, Judith Dwight, who studied at the university with him. And together, they went on to have four children. Later on, the family relocated to Australia. Hardy's changing behavior caused concerns regarding his mental health, leading to a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. After an argument between the couple, Hardy froze a bottle of water and struck his sleeping wife on the head with it, displaying a disturbing act of domestic violence. He's forcefully pulled her toward a bathtub and attempted to drown her. This was it for Mrs. Hardy. They got divorced in 1986. Four years afterward, he continued to stalk her. And during a session with a psychiatrist, Hardy confessed his desire to kill her. After the failure of his marriage, Hardy returned to Britain alone. He didn't get permanent residence, moving from hostel to hostel, occasionally staying in mental hospitals and engaging with prostitutes. He was prescribed medication to alleviate the effects of his bipolar disorder. During that period, Hardy started to engage in substance abuse and repeatedly broke the law, resulting in him serving a brief period in jail. This was a really dark path for Anthony. In January 2002, Hardy drew the attention of the police once again for pouring battery acid into a neighbor's mailbox. Around the same time, a concerned neighbor reported to the police that they suspected that something was wrong at Hardy's apartment. The tip led to the uncovering of a horrifying discovery. When the police arrived at Hardy's residence, they discovered that the bedroom door was locked. Upon breaking it open, they discovered the lifeless body of a young woman, unclothed, lying on his bed. According to a report by the Daily Mail, evidence suggests that the woman may have been murdered as she had cuts to her head, bite marks, and bruising. However, pathologists have asserted that her cause of death was a heart attack rather than foul play. The dead body was identified as a 38-year-old prostitute named Sally Rose White from the King's Cross area. He pled guilty to criminal damage, saying that he was unaware of how Sally White ended up in his apartment and blaming his drinking problem. Under Section 37 of the Mental Health Act of 1983, Anthony Hardy was admitted to a mental health facility. He remained there until the end of 2002. The investigation into Hardy's crime started in 2002, after dismembered body parts of two women were found in separate locations in Camden, London. A homeless person discovered the remains of two women, who had been mutilated, wrapped in black plastic garbage bags, on December 30th, 2002. The police initiated a large-scale investigation, initially facing challenges in identifying victims and establishing connections between crimes. The detectives diligently collected evidence, such as CCTV footage, witness statements, and forensic analysis, to establish a link between the murders. Bridget McClellan, 34, and Elizabeth Vallett, 29, were named as the victims by the police. As the investigation unfolded, Hardy became a suspect because of his proximity to the crime scenes and his unsettling behavior. Anthony Hardy was quickly identified because of the use of CCTV footage in the inquiry. An off-duty police officer recognized him while he went to pick up his insulin prescription from the University College Hospital. During a search of the hospital grounds, the officer located Hardy hidden between some trash cans. Anthony resisted arrest and fought back. He knocked out a cop while they were fighting. Another police officer was stabbed in the hand and had an eye dislocation. Anthony Hardy was finally taken into custody by the police when reinforcements arrived. Evidence, including old blood stains, suggesting the two ladies had been murdered and dismembered in his apartment, which was subsequently searched. Hardy, who initially refused to talk to the authorities after his detention, eventually confessed. He murdered Sally White for the deaths of Elizabeth and Bridget. He pled guilty. He took sexual advantage of them before killing them by strangulation. Hardy's true nature as a pornography-obsessed necrophiliac who finds sexual satisfaction in posing the nude bodies of his victims after death and taking explicit images of their naked corpses was disclosed to the jury. In 2010, Hardy was sentenced to life in prison. It should be one of those cases where life should mean life, said Mr. Justice Keith. Hardy died of sepsis at the age of 69 on November 26, 2020, in HM Prison, Franklin County, Durham. This is the case of Colin Ireland, a British serial killer infamously known as the Gay Slayer. As the name indicates, the victims of this killer were all gay. Ireland, who was born in Dartford, Kent, in 1954, had a difficult start in life. His father abandoned his young mother soon after his birth, leaving them to struggle against poverty on their own. 
Ireland and his mother lived in poor conditions and moved frequently. He had a hard childhood with many people trying to take advantage of him and even threatening his safety. As Ireland became older, he became entangled in a cycle of illegal activity. He spent time in Borstal, a correctional facility for young offenders for theft. His illegal behavior continued, resulting in convictions for robbery and extortion, as well as repeated prison sentences. His personal life was plagued by infidelity, violence, and strained relationships. Ireland eventually ended up in Southend-on-Sea, where he stayed in a hostel after becoming homeless. During this time, he frequented a gay club named the Colhern Arms in London, where he met his first victim, setting the stage for the devastating events that would follow. A 45-year-old choreographer named Peter Walker became the first victim of this merciless killer. Ireland went to Walker's Battersea flat, where he was shackled and eventually suffocated by a plastic bag placed over his head. Ireland added an unsettling touch to the crime scene by leaving two teddy bears in the 69 position on the deceased body. Meanwhile, Walker's dogs were kept in another room, oblivious to the catastrophe. Ireland took matters into his own hands the next day, unhappy with the lack of media attention around his horrible crime. He informed the Samaritans, a helpline organization, and a journalist from the Sun newspaper about the murder and the existence of the dogs. He voiced a warped yearning for fame in a surprising disclosure, expressing his ambition to become an infamous serial killer. Notably, a former lover of Walker came forward to the police, claiming that Walker did not willingly engage in sadomasochistic practices, meaning that he was forced by Ireland. Shortly after Walker's murder, Christopher Dunn, a 37-year-old librarian from Wealdstone, was discovered dead and naked wearing a harness. Because of the different geographical areas and separate teams of detectives involved, his death was initially thought to be an accident during an erotic game. Perry Bradley III, the third victim, was a 35-year-old businessman who Ireland met in the Colhern Arms. Ireland convinced Bradley to accompany him to his place with the promise of bondage. Despite Bradley's hesitation, Ireland deceived him by stating that his own sexual performance was based on elements of bondage. Ireland resorted to intimidation techniques, and when Bradley reluctantly consented, he found himself handcuffed to his bed. Ireland then demanded his pin and money with the threat of torture. Ireland extracted Bradley's pin after assuring them that he was only a burglar who would leave after taking the money and later stole 200 pounds from his account. Realizing that Bradley could identify him, Ireland used the ropes around Bradley's neck to silence him forever. Ireland added a distressing aspect to the crime scene by placing a doll on the deceased man's body. Andrew Collier, a 33-year-old housing warden, became Ireland's fourth victim in his reign of terror. They entered Collier's home in Dalston after a brief flirtation. They were inside when they heard a disturbance outside and went to the window to investigate. Ireland left his fingerprints on a metal bar at the window by accident and missed it during his cleaning routine. These critical prints were eventually discovered by the police, bringing them closer to identifying the culprit. Ireland demanded his victim's banking information after holding Collier down on the bed. Collier, however, objected. Ireland killed the cat and then used a noose to strangle Collier as he was enraged by his resistance and motivated by perverted fantasies. He performed the horrid act of inserting the dead cat's tail into Collier's mouth and placing the cat's mouth over Collier's genitalia. Ireland contacted the police the following morning after stealing 70 pounds and asking why they hadn't linked the four homicides. Ireland's fifth and last victim was a 41-year-old Maltese cook named Emmanuel Spiteri. He met Spiteri in the Colhern Arms and persuaded him to be tied to his bed in handcuffs. Ireland asked for Spiteri's pin, but he was unable to get it this time. He killed Spiteri by hanging him from a noose, as was his custom. He then set fire to the flat after methodically tidying and arranging the crime scene. He later contacted the police in an odd attempt to communicate with them, hinting at a body at the scene of a fire and said he was unlikely to commit another murder. Investigations revealed that Ireland and Spituri had left the Colhern pub together and taken the train. They were seen on security footage from the Charing Cross station. Ireland admitted to being with Spituri, but denied being the murderer, saying that he had left Spituri with someone else. Fingerprints discovered at Collier's flat, however, helped the authorities link Ireland to the crime. Ireland was charged with killing Collier and Spiteri, and while he was imprisoned awaiting his trial, he also admitted to killing three other people. 
He acknowledged that his decision to target gay males was motivated by his perception of them as weak and easy prey, not by any personal grudge. He robbed those he killed because of his lack of money and his unemployment and the cost of traveling to London to look for victims. Ireland was added to the Home Office's list of convicts who had been given whole life sentences on December 22, 2006, indicating that he would probably never be released. Ireland passed away on February 21, 2012, with pulmonary fibrosis and complications from a hip injury. This is the story of Graham Young, also known as the Teacup Poisoner. He was born on the 7th of September 1947 in Neasden, London. His crimes involved poisoning family members and co-workers with a poisonous tea or coffee. In his criminal cases, he used two poisons, antimony and thallium. Young's early life was marked by a troubled childhood and a strange fascination with toxic substances and chemicals. As a child, he showed a morbid curiosity about death and did experiments with poisoning on animals. His behavior raised many concerns and at the age of 14, he was sent to a mental institution for evaluation. By the age of 12, he became an expert in chemistry and pharmacology. And at 13, he read a book about a 19th century criminal who poisoned his mother and wife with antimony. The teenager especially remembered the conclusion that it's almost impossible to detect traces of antimony in the body of the deceased. And Graham wanted to check it out. One day after buying some antimony from a pharmacy, he decided to test it on a classmate, Chris Williams, who spoke harshly about his experiments with animals. Young put poison in his sandwiches and tea and soon Chris began to have stomach upsets. After Young went back home, his stepmother Molly found the vial of poison before he could complete his plan. Molly not only stopped Graham from continuing the experiments, but also made a scandal with the pharmacist who sold a dangerous substance to a minor. Within a couple of weeks, Young found another pharmacist, and instead of Williams, he decided to poison his stepmother. At first, Molly began to suffer from stomach pains, and in early 1962, she died. Her body was cremated, destroying all traces of the crime. The police suspected him of poisoning her, but there was no proof of this, and he was released. After the death of his stepmother, Graham began to test the poison on his aunt, father, and younger sister, making them all ill. One day, the school chemistry teacher exposed the poisoner. He found vials of antimony oxide and detailed methods for poisoning on Young's desk. On the 23rd of May, 1962, the teacher called the police and Graham was arrested. The police searched his home and discovered the poisons. Young admitted guilt only of attempted poisoning, but not of the murder of his stepmother. It was this and also the conclusion of a psychiatrist that saved him from prison. The court declared the defendant insane and sent him to a psychiatric hospital at Broadmoor Hospital. Later, psychologists concluded that the forced separation from loved ones had had a very strong effect on the boy's psyche. He decided that life is continuous pain and disappointment. In July 1962, according to Graham's police statement read out in court, he stated, the doses I was giving were not fatal, but I knew I was doing wrong. Visiting psychiatrist Donald Blair concluded that Graham Young is a psychopath. At his trial on July 6, 1962, Young was charged with the murder of his stepmother and attempted murder of his father, sister, and aunt. After six years in the psychiatric hospital, he was released, though his treatment did not lead to complete rehabilitation. In 1971, while working at John Hadlin Laboratories, he poisoned many colleagues with a toxic substance. He gave poison to his manager, Bob Egley, who was hospitalized. He was diagnosed with indigestion, convulsions, and vomiting. On July 7, 1971, Egley died. Later on, more of Graham's colleagues suffered from similar symptoms. Young's next victim was his workmate, Fred Biggs, who died on the 19th of September, 1971. The company doctor suspected something was wrong and reported it to management. Forensic experts then found traces of thallium in the blood of all the victims. On the 21st of November, 1971, Young was suspected, but there was no direct evidence against him. Investigators found a diary in his house with notes on the composition of poisons and a description of the reactions of the company employees to them. 
He denied everything at the trial, but the court found him guilty of two murders and several attempted murders. In July 1972, he was sentenced to life in a psychiatric hospital. He was sent to serve his term not in the familiar Broadmoor, but in a closed psychiatric clinic in Park Lane near Liverpool. He was given four life sentences. Graham spent the rest of his life in a maximum security prison, where he died on August 1st, 1990 of a heart attack. This is the story of Dennis Nilsson, who was one of the most notorious serial killers in British criminal history. It was a series of murders that shocked the world in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Dennis Nilsson killed at least 15 young men and flushed them down the toilet. Dennis Nilsson was the second child in his family. The marriage of his parents could not be called successful, mainly because of his father's addiction to alcohol. His parents got divorced, and in 1949, Nilsson, his mother, brother, and sister moved out. It was from there, in 1951, that the maniac began. Surprisingly, as a child, Dennis showed no signs of cruelty. He was kind to animals. He was very afraid of physical pain, as well as any sort of rudeness or aggressiveness. Dennis may have started to change after the death of his grandfather, when adults left him alone in the house with the dead body for six hours without any explanation. Nielsen himself said that this was a huge blow for him and that this event marked the beginning of his transformation into what later became a murderer and a necrophile. Let's unmask the hidden horrors of his shocking future crimes. Dennis Nilsson was a classic example of a serial killer with a need for authority and control. His victims were often vulnerable young men who were struggling with their lives. Dennis met his first victim at a gay bar in December 1978. At Nilsson's house, they drank beer and went to bed. And when the young man fell asleep, Nilsson began to stroke his body many times, fearing that his new friend would leave him. As happened with all the men in his life, the criminal picked up a tie from the floor and began to choke his victim with it. The young man began to resist. He and Nilsson fell off the bed to the floor. His victim passed out, but he was still alive. Then Nilsson took a bucket from the kitchen, filled it with water, brought it into the bedroom, and dipped his victim's head into it. The young man choked and was dead in a few minutes. In December, he killed his second victim, a 23-year-old Canadian student, Kenneth Ockenden, who he strangled with headphone cables, undressed, painted the dead body with makeup, washed his hair with shampoo, and finally put him in a cupboard. The body was there until Nilsson returned home from work. Later, he pulled out a new friend and took various pictures in different poses. Two days later, he placed the body under the floor, just like the first victims, and then, over the next two weeks, took it out at least four times to talk and watch TV together. Kenneth was the only victim of Nielsen, whose disappearance was reported to the police. In May 1980, Nielsen killed his third victim, 16-year-old homeless alcoholic drug addict Martin Duffy. The maniac also washed the body, performed his unusual manipulations with it, and after two weeks, put it under the floor of his home next to the rest of the bodies. In the middle of the summer, when the smell of the dead bodies became unbearable, the killer decided to clean his house. He hid some of the dismembered bodies in the barn, buried some in the garden, and placed entrails into the garbage can around his area. At the end of the summer, Nielsen, in a state of intoxication, committed the fourth murder. He did not remember the details of it. Later, detectives identified the victim as 26-year-old Billy Sutherland. It was in 1983 that Nilsson's murder spree finally came to an end. He was arrested after worried neighbors, called in a plumber to clear a sewage blockage. To the horror of the plumber, the blockage was caused by huge chunks of rotting meat stuck in the pipe. The plumber reported this to the police. Nilsson, who learned about this, secretly made his way to the sewer manhole at night to remove the remains. But his neighbor noticed, and he was arrested the next day. In 1983, Nilsson was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. The court found him guilty of committing six murders and two attempted murders. But the offender himself first said that he had killed 15 people and then 12. After the murders, he washed and dressed the bodies of his victims, for which he received the nickname Good Natured Killer. The interrogation of the maniac lasted a week. During one of the interrogations, Nielsen could not find an ashtray, and then someone suggested throwing his cigarette butt down the toilet. 
The maniac's answer was extraordinary. He said, the last time I threw something down the toilet, I had serious problems. Among other things, he also said, it is good that you have arrested me now. If you had waited until I was 65, there would have been thousands of corpses. The interrogation revealed the frightening details of Nielsen's criminal actions that left the authorities and the public in shock. Dennis Nielsen died on May 12, 2018 of natural causes. This is the case of an English serial killer, known as the Stockwell Strangler. Kenneth Erskine was born on July 1, 1963 in Hammersmith. He had three brothers and was born to a British mother and an Antiguan father. Unfortunately, both of his parents abandoned him when he was a child, forcing him to attend special schools. His parents divorced when he was 12 years old, and his behavior became increasingly hostile. In 1986, at the age of 22, he went on a horrible spree of violence against elderly people in their homes across London. On April 9, 1986, Nancy Ems, a 78-year-old Wandsworth resident, became Erskine's first victim. Her death was initially misattributed to natural causes. Only when her housekeeper noticed that her television was missing was foul play suspected. Following a post-mortem, she was discovered to have been sexually violated and strangled. Janet Cockett, 67, the second victim, died on June 9, 1986. She was the chairperson of the Tenants Association of her Wandsworth housing estate. Despite the fact that her death was initially assumed to be natural, a post-mortem revealed that she had been killed. Erskine did not take sexual advantage of her, unlike the previous victim. His palm print was discovered on a window at Cockett's flat, connecting him to the crime scene. Then, on the 28th of June, 1986, a terrible turn of events added two more victims to Erskine's dreadful toll. This time, he committed his horrible crimes at the Stockwell residence. Valentin Gleam, an 84-year-old World War II veteran, and Zbigniew Stabrava, 94, were his victims. Both men were brutally strangled after enduring the horrors of sexual assault. On July 8, 1986, Erskine claimed his fifth victim, 84-year-old William Carmen from Islington, continuing his reign of terror. Carmen's flat had money stolen from it, and he too had been molested and strangled. William Downs, age 74, Erskine's sixth victim, met the same fate on July 21, 1986. Scotland Yard's Detective Chief Superintendent Ken Thompson took up the investigation of the infamous Stockwell Strangler as the case gained widespread notoriety. To find this elusive criminal, a squad of nearly 200 officers was put together. The fingerprints discovered at the crime scene were successfully linked by the detectives to Kenneth Erskine, a well-known figure in the criminal underworld. Because of his earlier burglary convictions, the police already had his fingerprints and photos on file, which enabled them to link him to the killing spree. However, finding him proved to be a difficult task. Tragically, Erskine claimed his final victim while investigators were searching for him. Florence Tisdall, an 83-year-old widow living alone in Fulham, on the morning of the 23rd of July, 1986, the caretaker discovered her lifeless body. The horrible act of manual strangulation, sexual advantage, and her shattered ribs revealing the killer's cruelty, including kneeling on her chest. The discovery of a significant piece of information marked the investigation's turning point. Officers found that Erskine frequently visited a Department of Social Security office in Southwark to pick up his unemployment benefit payments. In anticipation of his arrival, detectives planned and set up surveillance on the building. As luck would have it, Erskine showed up on time to pick up his money, walking right into a trap. The watchful detectives handcuffed him as he was joining the queue. The Stockwell Strangler's reign of terror was put to an end without opposition. However, the detectives faced a significant hurdle during the subsequent interrogation. Erskine behaved in a disturbing manner, laughing, staring out the window at the sky, and acting inappropriately. It became clear that Erskine had a clever mind, even though he was troubled. A search of his possessions turned up information about 10 bank and building society accounts he had set up to hide the proceeds of his burglaries, giving proof of his complex financial schemes. Amazingly, 
Erskine continued to get unemployment benefits while making deposits into these accounts totaling almost 3,000 pounds during his murderous rampage. Police believe Erskine was involved in four other cases, including the murders of Wilfred Parks and Trevor Thomas, even after he was ultimately found guilty on seven charges of murder. Charges for these offenses could not, however, be filed against him due to inadequate evidence. The attacker's ammo was confirmed by the police. No evidence of forceful entry was present, proving that the intruder entered through unlocked windows. In each instance, the murderer crouched on the victim's chests, covering their mouths with his left hand, and tightened his grasp around their throats with his right hand until the victims passed away. Four of the victims additionally displayed evidence of sodomy, although it was unclear exactly when this occurred in relation to the victim's deaths. His troubling behavior, which included instances of public masturbation, was on display throughout Erskine's trial, which took place in January 1988. Following his convictions for the seven murders, he was given a life sentence with a minimum suggested period of 40 years. Erskine, however, was eventually found to have a mental condition in accordance with the Mental Health Act of 1983. As a result, in 1988, he was moved to the high-security Broadmoor Hospital, where he has stayed ever since. The judge's recommendation is one of the most severe in British judicial history, so it's unlikely that Erskine will be released before he turns 65 in 2028. Authorities fear that Erskine may have committed further killings prior to his known victims, speculating that many deaths may have been attributed to natural causes due to age, and fragility. The looming prospect that Erskine's body count was larger than officially documented persists. This was the horrifying story of the Stockwell Strangler. The next killer on the line is Levi Belfield. He was a brutal serial killer in the 2000s, known for his senseless and misogynistic serial killing spree. On the 17th of May, 1968, Levi Belfield was born in Aylworth, Middlesex, England, to a middle-class family. He had a terrible upbringing, full of hardship and dysfunctional relationships at home. His father died of leukemia, and Belfield had a weird relationship with his mother. Belfield's history of aggressive behavior, even at a young age, foreshadowed the crimes that he would commit later in life. Certainly, it appears that his brash self-confidence made him far more successful with women than his ordinary appearance. As a young man, Belfield fathered at least 11 children by as many different women. His apparent friendly personality even deceived the police who caught him. When we first started working with him, he seemed like a jokester, almost like an old friend. However, he is an intelligent and dangerous man. Instantaneously, he can change from being pleasant to being unpleasant. During his criminal spree, Levi Belfield only targeted girls. He killed many women other than his girlfriends. His main method of attack was to stalk and pick off defenseless victims, usually at night. He would viciously attack them with hammers, tire irons, and other weapons. The merciless killings of Millie Dower, a 13-year-old student, and Marsha McDonald, a 19-year-old student, were among his most bizarre acts. He was a sex offender and enjoyed torturing women, making them helpless and vulnerable. People were horrified by Belfield's acts, and he left a wake of destruction and panic. In 2003, Marsha McDonald, then 19 years old, was discovered dead, just feet from her Hampton home. After a night out with friends, she got off the bus to be savagely bludgeoned by this merciless killer. Her father told the media, the pain of Marsha's death is simply indescribable, and I know it will never go away until the day that I die. Kate Sheedy, at 18 years old, was the victim of Levi's hit and run in Aylworth in 2004. She called her mother from her cell phone as she lay broken on the ground, acutely aware of what had happened. Kate Sheedy thankfully made it through the cruel attack with a broken arm, leg, and ribs, and with terrible internal injuries. Amélie Delagrange, a 22-year-old French national, was found bludgeoned to death in Twickenham Green later that same year. There were identical methods of stalking, attacking, and hitting. These similarities to the murder of Marsha McDonald were striking. Belfield was responsible for all of these acts, as well as an attempt on Kate Sheedy's life. Unfortunately, the lack of forensic evidence made it difficult to apprehend Belfield. Finally, CCTV footage was found, solving the murder of Amélie Delagrange, as it showed a white van parked nearby. The killer, it was decided, would prowl the streets looking for women who caught his eye. Authorities tracked down the killer after searching for a van matching the description. 
They received a tip about a man called Belfield, who drove a white van and was known to have an aggressive streak of behavior. When the police raided his house, he was hiding under his loft's insulation, naked and acting terrified. Belfield's history was revealed after he was also convicted of the 2002 murder of Millie Dowler while serving his time in prison. The Millie Dowler case made headlines due to the vulnerability of the young victim and the subsequent phone hacking controversy in which it was revealed that journalists from the tabloids had hacked into her voicemail. Belfield was found guilty in 2011 on all counts and given a life sentence without the possibility of release. The communities in which he prayed finally had relief after he was found guilty, and the victim's families found closure. Imagine post-war London in the 1950s, dark and grim. People were afraid and tired, and everyone sought solace in new beginnings. Here, a horrific tale of death was born. In the quiet neighborhood of Notting Hill, a predator prowls in the lives of unsuspecting innocents. John Christie was an ordinary looking man who had a dangerous fixation with authority and control. In private, he lured women with this promise of salvation only to inflict agony, terror, and death on them. He turned out to be a necrophiliac, a gruesome murderer with rage and homicidal tendencies. He killed many women, including his wife, and then buried them at his house. The police found human bones beneath his garden fence. Christie was a smart man with a history of being brilliant at school. He had an IQ of 128, but despite having an IQ that put him in the top 5% of England's best minds, he was insecure and had intimacy issues in his teenage years. Unfortunately, that made him use his intelligence in the most atrocious ways. Shocked at his wickedness, the authorities made reforms to the British criminal justice system. Born into a dysfunctional family in 1899, he had a rough upbringing. Early on, Christie struggled with feelings of isolation and developed a propensity for lying, both of which would play crucial roles in his criminal career. It was found in his memoirs that the death of his grandfather, a strong, aggressive man, exposed him to the taste of authority over dead bodies. He stated, that scary man was lying helpless on the kitchen table. He was apparently a soft-spoken person, and none of his acquaintances believed it when his crime spree was revealed. In the late 1940s, after settling at 10 Rillington Place in Notting Hill, London, Christie began engaging in criminal activity. He pretended to be a nice, normal guy next door and invited women around. Once he had their trust, he would take sexual advantage of them or kill them. Because of his dual personality and his cleverness, he was able to deceive the whole justice system and convict an innocent man for his wife's murder, which was actually committed by Christie himself. His wife supported him through the trial of Mrs. Evans' death and helped him frame her husband. Then Christie's wife herself became a victim, and later he buried her under the floorboards of his living room. After that, he killed many women. Eight of them were identified, as he used to keep trophies of his victims. Plenty of the trophies were not matched to the dead bodies found in his yard, in the walls or under the floorboards. One of the trophies was a bunch of unidentified pubic hair, so you can imagine the extent of the sickness of this man. He used to lure women to their deaths by promising to treat their illnesses or by performing illegal abortions on them. He stowed the corpses away in his home's many secret nooks and crannies, as well as under the floorboards. That's a pattern of many necrophiliacs. In 1953, when people noticed a foul smell coming from his house, the investigation into Christie's misdeeds began. Christie's wife, Ethel, who he had murdered years before, was found among the bodies by the police. The magnitude of the crimes prompted an extensive media coverage across the country. Christie was identified and put on trial for the death of his wife. He claimed insanity, and so claimed he was incompetent to face trial. As the investigation continued, however, his true nature and objectives emerged. Christie's crime wave in its entirety was exposed by the investigation. His wife Ethel and other women who came to him for counsel or company were among the eight individuals found dead. Two of his most famous victims were the Evan family, including Timothy and Beryl Evans. Christie was also found to be responsible for the unsubstantiated murder of Evan's infant daughter. Another victim of his was a prostitute named Kathleen Maloney. He lured the poor girl by promising her clothes from his dead wife and shelter. 
Kathy was gassed by him before being strangled. Christy confessed to molesting Kathy's dead body and leaving her tied to a chair in the kitchen while he went to sleep. The next morning he had tea, sitting beside the dead body of a poor 24-year-old girl, and then disposed of her in the vent by his kitchen. He stated, it was little Kathy I felt sorry for. She was a sweet kid. I felt sorry for her. The John Christie case left a permanent mark on British law enforcement. Increased scrutiny and adjustments in the capital sentence procedure followed an unlawful execution of Timothy Evans. This chilling tale of horror takes us to Victorian England. The Victorian era is still known for its dark secrets and dual characters in history. This true story will show us the darkest crime one can think of at the hands of a woman. When it comes to children, women are generally known for their unconditional love and kind hearts. However, this is the story of Amelia Dyer. She was born in a poor household in a village near Bristol called Pyle Marsh. Her early life remains unknown. Her unbelievable crime spree started around the 1860s when she started working as a baby farmer. Wearing the mask of a compassionate and helpful member of the community, she took babies from unmarried mothers for a fee in the name of taking care of them. These helpless victims of society believed that she would bring a better life for their newborns. She turned out to be a baby killer. She was not just a killer, but a monster who tortured them to death. The most vulnerable creatures in the world, newborn babies, were her victims. And what's worse, they were happily handed over to her by their own mothers to be taken care of and to foster them with better parents. Unmarried mothers would find solace in baby farming businesses where strangers took their babies for a fee and in return promised to find loving families who would adopt them. These poor mothers were unaware that they were paying for a torturous death for their child. Amelia was definitely the most heartless and gruesome baby farmer to exist. It was 1869 when a doctor named George Ernest Smith became suspicious after many dead infants were brought to him after their bodies were discovered in the River Thames over a period of a few days. This news was horrifying enough for the whole country. The doctor discovered horrific details on the dead bodies. He noticed a pattern and an investigation began that led the police to Amelia. The heinous charge of multiple infant homicides was given to this monster. As the inquiry continued, the full scope of Dyer's crimes revealed a terrifying story of murder, greed, and unfathomable evil that sends chills down our spines. In 1896, the police tracked down Dyer after discovering a package containing a dead infant in the river. They suspected Dyer due to previous allegations. So they stormed her house and arrested her. Dyer eventually confessed to her crimes during the subsequent interrogation, detailing the terrible scope of her baby killing rampage. She confessed without remorse that she killed them by strangling them, giving them an overdose of medicine and then starving them to death. Dyer's killing spree lasted for years and she probably killed hundreds of babies. The number is unknown because of the secrecy surrounding her crimes and the fact that many of the bodies were never found. Although, there are estimated to be between 200 and 400 infant victims. She used to wrap them in a cloth, throw them in the river, or bury them in her garden. Amelia Dyer's trial and execution took place in March 1896. She had no regret for her conduct, despite admitting to killing multiple infants. The court determined that she was responsible for the death of the baby who was discovered in the Thames. Dyer was given a death sentence of hanging. She was put to death at London's Newgate Prison on June 10th, 1896. Stephen John Port, who was born on February 22nd, 1975, is an Englishman from Southend-on-Sea, Essex. His story is unusual when it comes to British serial killers, from both his victim choice and how modern the case is. The man was only apprehended in 2015, Let's get into it. As a child, Stephen's family moved to Dagenham, East London, where he was raised and where his parents now live. Port experienced bullying in schools during his early years and was frequently singled out as a loner. A neighbor described him as having an odd, childlike demeanor and even playing with children's toys as an adult. He lived with his parents up until his early 30s before deciding to move into a flat in Barking, London. He worked as a chef for a stagecoach in a West Ham bus depot, 
and briefly appeared on the television program MasterChef. Port's frequent trips to the gym helped him maintain an athletic appearance at the time of the murders. Port used a number of social networks, dating apps, and hookup apps to find his victims on websites that catered to gay and bisexual people. This fueled his further descent to darkness. He fabricated stories about his background to mislead them, including stating that he was an Oxford University graduate and a former Royal Navy serviceman. Another time, he identified himself as a teacher of students with special needs. Through these lies, he would meet multiple young men, and the crime soon followed. On the 17th of June, 2014, Port made contact with Anthony Walgate, a 23-year-old fashion student who occasionally worked as an escort. Walgate was Port's first victim. Port met Walgate at Barking Station after posing as a client and offering him 800 pounds for his service. He lured Walgate to his flat, where he gave him GHB to knock him out and take sexual advantage of him. Tragically, Walgate passed away from a heroin overdose caused by Port. On June 19th, early in the morning, Port anonymously called for an ambulance while disposing of the body by dragging it onto the pavement next to his home. To avoid giving away his identity, Port pretended to be a young boy who had fainted, or was having a seizure, or was intoxicated. He then quickly went back to his flat. Even though medical help arrived, Walgate was declared dead just before 8 a.m. Unfortunately, important information linking Port to Walgate's death was overlooked. Inconsistencies in Port's answers to the police about the death led to his conviction for perverting the course of justice in March 2015. He was given an eight-month term but was freed in June under the condition that he submit to electronic monitoring. He then committed a string of heinous acts between August 2014 and September 2015 assaulting and killing four innocent people. Gabriel Kavari, a 22-year-old Slovakian who briefly lived with Port, Daniel Whitworth, a 21-year-old chef from Kent, and Jack Taylor, a 25-year-old forklift truck worker from Dagenham, were among his victims. A woman walking her dog discovered the bodies of the last two victims in a church graveyard in Barking, while the final victim was located in a nearby park. Port left a falsified suicide note near Whitworth's body to cover his horrific actions, implying his involvement in the previous victim's death and that he had committed suicide out of guilt. The Metropolitan Police originally neglected to link these cases, considering them unrelated and non-suspicious. Even though the crime scenes were close to Port's flat, and there were mounting worries voiced by internet communities and LGBT advice groups. Port was charged with murder and poisoning in 2015. Following that, during the trial at the Old Bailey in June 2016, further charges were introduced, including more counts of poisoning, sexual crimes, and manslaughter. Port was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order on November 25, 2016, and is now imprisoned at HMP Belmarsh. Surprisingly, it was discovered that Port had actually assaulted 11 individuals in total. The subsequent How Police Missed the Grinder Killer BBC documentary shed light on the shoddy investigation of Port's crimes. A tragedy for all of the families and friends of the victims.